So welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining and sticking around with these uh, slight tef technical uh, difficulties. Uh, I'm gonna move the camera here so I can see the chat better. Uh, I, tonight we're learning. We're learning the Eluni Shmat Tzila Bat Rabbi David as well as Rabbi Avram ben Rabbi Chaim Yehuda and Yechaskel ben Rabbi Avram. We're also learning the Refua Shalema to Avram Yaakov ben Yal, as well as Refua Shalema to Chava Bas Chayes Esther. All right, so now let's get started. So the um, we we are going to jump around, uh, you know, with topics. Uh, I think moving forward, I think that's going to be keeping people on their toes and gives a little bit of a different perspective of different things. So we're going to go between Perkei Avos, between uh, at Perkei Avos, and between the um, um, the slipping my mind now. Why is it slipping my mind now? The Kava Yashar. That's such an amazing safer. Anyway, so so uh, so tonight we're going to go on the on the Perkei Avos. Now the Perkei Avos is something that I feels. It, it's one of those. It's one of those subjects that gets a lot of attention because a lot of people speak about it. But because it gets a lot of attention, I feel it goes to the waste. Meaning, people don't tend to understand the depth and the beauty of it because there's so much. There's so much that one can uncover, one can uh, learn with uh, with Perky Elvis. But the problem is that people say, "Oh, Perky Elvis, okay, I learned it so many times already. I know it already. Okay, fine, let's skip it." There are so many things that you can learn. I've been learning it for years, and every time I learn it, there's not just like a little nuance that I learned something more that's like there's a whole world of information that I learned before that I learned that I didn't learn before that is so tonight we're going to be starting the first the the third Mishnah in the first parak, and that is it's a very fascinating um it's a very fascinating uh um Mishnah a Mishnah that has so much so much depth and how it relates even to our day and age that we just have to start, you know, like plugging, uh, you know, plugging things in, uh, you know, to to see how it connects so much into our day to day lives and how much of the people that we deal with around us. So just to give you a little bit of a background. Now, when we ever we do background, some people love it, some people hate it. So bear with me. So. When we look at the Mishnah and Perkei Avos, we see a select few Tanaim that are written and that are spoken about in the Mishnah. That is not to say that those were only the big rabbis that were present during this time. From the giving the Torah to on Har Sinai to the days of with this Mishnah, which is the the, the head rabbi, the most the the biggest rabbi was Antigonus. He th there was thousands of big Torah sages. The reason why these were mentioned, these were the these were the the biggest but even if you look at, at at this mishnah we'll see how how big this rabbi was there was only one mention of his antigonus ish Saichai was only the one mention an entire like torch about that we have there was only one saying that he had this is the biggest rabbi we only have one saying and the one of the reasons is is that there was never any arguments during those times of the sages. Therefore, the names are mentioned. The Torah was given in its entirety and was transmitted in its entirety, and people knew it, and there was no questions until the time came uh, during the time of the second base of English where there was more of an exile imminent and there was more of like, you know, situational things that arise. There's a lot of factors that came into play that caused uh, um, uh, to be machlokas, to be arguments. Again, we're not going to speak about that. This, If you are interested in that, you could look into the, the class that we gave on in the Divinity series on machlokas and arguments, and we spoke in depth on about how, when, where, why, how they all came about. But in any case, the um, the reason why these me these sages are mentioned in Perkei is these were the greatest sages of the time, and these were 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 pearls of wisdom is an understatement about what we can to improve our lives and how do we improve our relationship with the Torah, with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, and with our, uh, uh, you know, Ben Gavra the Gavra, between people, how do we improve that, as well as between us and ourselves. So, the Mishnah begins that Atinginus Ish Ish Seichai. Atinginus Ish Seichai, the, the term Ish means leader. He was the leader of the Jewish uh, people, and he was from the town called Seichai. Now, Antigonus was a very wealthy person. He, uh, it, you know, it, it is it is mentioned in Avos Rav Nassim that he only used uh, gold and silver vessels. He was a very, very wealthy, very, very uh, po uh, powerful person. However, with all this, he still was never arrogant. He never acted any any in any essence of of arrogance. And when the Mishnah says that Kibel Mishim and so the Mishnah says Antigonus Ish Seichai, Antigonus, the man from Seichai, Kibel, he received from Ish Tzadik the uh, uh, the idea. 
of the terminology of received means that he was a personal disciple of Shevan Atzalik. So for all that remember, again, we're, we're, we're not always continuing on Perkei Havis. We do move it around. So whoever remembers that we spoke about uh, Shevan Atzalik, how great he was, the greatest, you know, like the Kohen Gadol, the unbelievable person that he was, the main disciple was the, the this, this this rabbi in this in this Mishnah, and that is Antigonus. So, so the... The personal, the personal disciple of uh, of Shimon Atzadik was the rabbi of this Mishnah. Once Shimon Atzadik was nifter, he passed away. The leadership until this point, Shimon Atzadik was not only the the political leader, he was also also the spiritual leader. He was a Kohen Gadol. So he had he had two, well back then it was one position, and then when Shimon HaTzadik was Nifter, it split into two positions. Again, if you're not interested in this stuff, just bear with me. We're going to be done soon, so you'll have a little bit just of, uh, you know, information, uh, an understanding, a little bit of, the, of a broader uh, bird's eye view of what's going on. So, First, it was Shimon Atzadik, and he was the spiritual leader, he was the political leader. When he died, when he was Nifter, it split into two. Why did it split into two? Because the two people that were going to go and replace him as Kohen Gadol, which was either his brother or his son, were not on the spiritual level of, of Shimon Atzadik. Meaning, so he had a brother in law, right? He had a son, Chanyo. They were not on the spiritual level to be the leader, the spiritual leader of the Jewish people. And that's why it split up. You know, they took the, the, the Kahuna, the Kohen Gadol, and the, the, the spiritual spiritual leadership, the rabbi leadership that went on to his student Antigonus. So it's very interesting also how, how things transition through time. You know, like it, when you look through history, you see how there's always there's always something in motion and things are always transitioning. Uh, if you're able to be, you know, like success, successful in either in whatever it is in stocks, you're able to like foresee that transition. You're able to foresee where thing where, where something is going to end up. And that's why the um, the mission does tell us Ezu and someone who can see the future. So things were sort of transitioning at this point in time, and that was after like it started splitting and then it kept on splitting. After uh, uh, um, Antigonus was, was was Nifter, the spiritual leadership also broke out into two. And when it broke out into two, this was a period in Jewish history that were, was known as the Zugos. The Zugos was this uh, partnership. There was always two leading sages at the time. One of them was a Nasi, was like the president of the Sanhedrin. The other one was the Av Bezdin, was the presiding judge of the Sanhedrin. So it sort of like split into two. So. Antigonus was, uh, Shimon HaTzadik had the, had the kuna and the spiritual leadership. Antigonus, his student, had the spiritual leadership, but not the kuna. And then after that, the spiritual leadership also broke out into two. And this was known as the Zugos. And this went on for five, for five generations. And we'll soon see, you know, as, as uh, the, the Mishnah goes on, as the next Mishnah goes on, you see that his students, you know, are saying something. So it goes through, uh, to a certain extent, through gener generational order. But in any case, so Shimon HaTzadik now is the leader of the, spiritual leader of the Jewish nation. And this is what he said. This is what the Mishnah says, that he, he was said, Al tihu, I'm saying it in Hebrew, and then I'm going to translate it. Not that much Hebrew, don't worry about it. Al tihu ka'avadim ha'meshamshin es harav al menas l'kabel pras. He says, don't be like servants that serve Serve the master on the condition to get reward. Ella, rather, you should serve your master on the condition not to get reward. And then he finishes off the Mishnah, fear of heaven on you. That is the Mishnah. We're going to go into depth on it, but that is the actual literal translation. It now. There, this is a very fascinating Mishnah just because of what was the outcome that happened. So what Antigonus said was. Don't serve your master to get reward. Serve it not to get reward. He had two students, I think it is. I think it is had two students. One of them was named was Tzadok. The other name was Baisos. Now these two students of his, they misinterpreted what he meant. He said, don't serve your master to get reward. They came to a conclusion. Wait a minute. What does that mean that our rabbi said, don't serve your master, which is referring to God, to get reward. That must be that there's no reward. So wait a minute. If there's no reward, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we religious? Why are we rabbis? Why are we learning all day? Like, what do we need all this for if there's no reward for it? Now, again, this is not what he meant, but this is what, how, how, they took it, how they took it away. So they came to the conclusion that they rejected the oral law. Now, it's very interesting. If they don't believe in that there's not going to be any reward, 
then why did they just reject the oral law? So we know that there's two, there's, there, there's the written law, which is Tanakh, and then there is the oral law, which now we see the Mishnahis and the Gemaras and all how the rabbis expanded, uh, expounded on the, on, the, on the Torah, on the, on the written law. So there's the written law and there's the oral law. They said, oh, wait a minute, there's no reward, so let's not listen to the oral law. So the obvious question is like, wait a minute. If they don't believe that there's any reward, what's the difference between the written law and the oral law? Just l- let everything go. And the reasoning is, one of the reasoning is, is that if they would have came out and said, oh, by the way, there is no reward, so the Torah is whatever, you know, doesn't, doesn't make a difference, and we don't have to follow anything. And not the Torah, not the written law, not the oral law. If they would have came out with that conclusion, everybody, they, they would have gotten stoned. They'd be like, what do you mean? It, it was not too long ago that we stood at Har Sinai. We know that God gave the Torah. We know that God gave us all the mitzvahs. Like, this is something that we know as a fact. It's an historical fact. They weren't able to sell that. The only thing that they were able to sell was like, okay, fine, wait a minute. Well, to a certain extent, they really weren't able to sell, but they, but they did succeed to a certain extent, unfortunately. Was they'll be like, okay, you know, like the Torah, okay, fine. Like we know that God gave the Torah. Like we, everybody was there. It's historical. It's like everybody knows about it. But the rabbis, like, come on, like they're making stuff up. Like they're, what are they doing? You know, like they're just saying, you know, like we, how do we, and they utilize that to say like, oh, we don't have to listen because uh, the rabbis. And that's why I said, they, so they, they split the oral law and the written law. I said we don't have to listen to the oral to the oral law. So even though even though this is in the Torah itself, it says they have to listen to the rabbis. In the Torah itself, in Devarim chapter seventeen, verse eleven, it's it says Al Pia Taira Shayerucha on the law that they instruct you, that the rabbis instruct you, Vala Mishpat Deshayemulcha, the judgment that they tell you, Leisasim and Adavar Shayegitulcha Yaminus Mol. Do not divert. From anything that the rabbis tell you, not to the right, not to the left. Meaning, the Torah says straight out. Whatever the rabbis tell you to do, you have to listen. That's what says straight out in the Torah. Oh, well, they didn't know this. Th- no, we'll soon see why they just blew past this and they didn't really, really associate it with anything. So, the two students of Antigonus, they came to the conclusion that they started, that there's no reward, and hence they started preaching don't, uh, uh, they started preaching sort of a, a, uh, a separation from what the rabbis thought and said that we don't have to listen to the rabbis, we just have to listen to the, to the, to, to the written law. Even though the vast majority of the Jewish people, they were no, they're like, what are these people are saying? Like, it, 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 the vast majority did not agree with what they were saying, but there were wicked people that did, you know, catch on to this, to this, uh, to this train of saying, like, wait a minute, okay, fine, maybe we don't have to listen to the rabbis, like, maybe we should listen to these two students of Antigonus. So, let's try to, like, take a little bit of a, a, a in reverse, like a drone view, like, back it up, and let's go from a bird's eye view, and let's see what was going on in the world at this time. So, in the previous classes that we spoke about in Perkei Elvis, we spoke about Alexander the Great, the Hellenistic culture, and that's what really was going on. Because remember that Shimon Atzadik was the Rebbe, the Rabbi of Antigonus Ish So he was a Rabbi, and during that time, he even met with Alexander the Great. What happened during the time of Alexander the Great? Alexander the Great had tremendous amount of success in conquering the, the most of the civilized world at that time. And what happened was he spread a, a sort of a culture, the, the Hellenistic culture, that is. What's the Hellenistic, uh, the Hellenistic culture? The uh, Hellenistic derives, the, it stems from the word uh, hilas, which is in Greek, the name for Greek. So it basically, it pushed out the Greek culture to the entire world. So Alexander conquered, had, had a tremendous amount of land. Now, uh, you know, up to this point in time, there was no media, there was no internet, there was no phone ones, there was no intercommunication of different, unless you travel somewhere. But if you owned the same, the land, even though it's vast, the information traveled more freely because it was all part of the same, of the same land. So the ideology, the theories, the thought process of Greek thought spread out to wherever Alexander the Great, wherever his, his, uh, his, his uh, uh, con- conquests reached. So these went through all areas, went through Egypt, through Asia, and it even ended up in Israel as, as well. So all the art that the Greek art, the sciences, the mathematics, the philosophy, which is going to be important, all this flourished in the, all the areas and spread out very quickly. And this is what Hellenism is. It's the spread of the Greek, of the Greek culture. 
So you have in all these area in, in all these areas that he conquered, and even the nearby areas that he conquered, there were Greek temples. There were uh, the the um, they came out with the sports arenas for for entertainment, which is very different than what we see as sports, right? You think sports arena, so you think okay, fine, baseball. They played some base some sort of baseball or basketball or something like that. No, it was very different back then. It was a very immodest uh, a form of entertainment that they had back then. So the problem was is that this presented a tremendous amount it, it presented a tremendous amount of a spiritual block for for people and these this this uh, spiritual it was also more like a you know uh, a spiritual hindrance uh, you know towards people so the Jews when they were traveling for work for they were you know there were, a lot of them would be in trade they visited these types of cities even though it even eventually ended up in Eretz Israel but they visit up visited these types of, of of cities that had this Greek culture and the Jews that were more let's call it lightheaded or more freer in a, in a certain extent uh, um, they were very interested in the Greek culture they were very impressed by the external beauty the Hellenism all the this this new age this new age thinking so they visited these sports arenas, they visited these temples, they visited these amusement places, they participated in the festivities that these, you know, Greek, uh, you know, uh, ideologies and Greek mindset that they had. And what happened was eventually they ended up throwing off the yoke of, of you know, of Torah. The God-fearing Jews, the good Jews, the religious Jews, they didn't enter these places, but they didn't have the power to prevent it from the other Jews from going into them. Again, they were traveling, they were all over the place, so they didn't really have that, uh, um, ability to to prevent them uh, you know from from going so these new philosophies that now the Jews are learning and their Jews are getting influence it focuses on very much the materialistic world it doesn't focus on an actual it focus on this world it focuses the Greek the Greek methodology the Greek ideology focus on having a good life achieving happiness enjoying yourself that's what they focus in fact there was a very famous Greek philosopher by the name of Epicurus, and he, his main philosophy was something that's called egoistic hedonism, which is focusing only on the pleasures of your body, and that is what is the most important thing in the world. There's nothing else that goes above it. That's what he preached, that was his theology, and it spread out, again, with people that want to hear what they want to hear, right? If they hear that, be like, oh, the most important thing is to make sure you have pleasure. Be like, oh yeah, who doesn't like pleasure? So let me check off that box. That's the thing that I want to do. And a lot of people bought into it, whether they agreed or even understood with it. They just heard the main thing. They'll be like, oh, yeah, fun time, good time. Why not? Let's, have, let's do that. And this is what he preached. He preached that the only thing that is valuable is one's own pleasure. That's the only thing. Anything else that has value is just a means of securing the pleasure to someone's out. Meaning that anything else that has a value is one removed from just getting the pleasure. That's all it was. And that's why a lot of his followers... They chose the path of just like getting some sort of bodily pleasure. Eat, you know, like they, they claim the best thing that a person can do is eat, is drink, and is, is to indulge in whatever it is that they want to indulge in. That is the most important thing, and that is what they preach. There's another uh, principle that he preached, and that is happiness is the purpose of man's actions. And the expression of happiness, this is where he went a little bit off, because happiness is the purpose of many of man's actions, but the expression of happiness is, is, is to rest and to relax. That is the expression of happiness. This is where he went way off. But in any case, this was his uh, uh, his theology. This was this was his uh, you know his thought process. The and they took it a step further. Be like, wait a minute. If the main purpose of everything is to enjoy yourself and to relax and to rest, that means that God would also relax and rest because that's the ultimate pleasure, right? According to this thought process, that's the ultimate pleasure. So if God needs to rest and to uh, relax, that means, and this is the theology, that he doesn't care what happens in this world. He doesn't punish. He doesn't reward. Because what? Anything like this, he, uh, you know, because claims that will disturb his tranquility. It will disturb his peace. So rather, he doesn't care about anything. So this was the thought process that was being pushed out by the Greek culture. The Greek culture was the most important factor is just pleasure in this world. The 
the the the the pleasure is also the aspect of achieving happiness and having the ability to be able to rest and to relax and hence just like god rests and relax doesn't care doesn't care what you do you can do whatever you want any pleasure you want any happiness whatever you want there is no reward and there is no there's no punishment so this is the time that this was being pushed out this is the time of antigonus Isaiah. he you know this it was during this time that this this philosophy was coming out so he came out with his Mishnah to fight against Epicurus, against this, this Greek, Greek thought process. And that's why he was saying the best thing for man to do is to do good for the sake of good. Forget about reward. Forget about all these things. Forget That's not the purpose of, of your focus. The purpose of you doing good is so that you should do good. That's what you should be focused on. Just doing good. That's your main focus and that should be your main reasoning. And that's why he also finished, let the fear of heaven be on you. That's what Antigonus finishes off the Mishnah, that the fear of heaven should be on you, be, to go against what, what this Epicurus philosopher was saying. Be like, no, God rewards, God punishes, God oversees everything. Don't listen to what this, uh, this Greek philosopher is, is teaching. So you have these two philosophies that were going against each other. Now, during the time of Antigonus, this wasn't yet apparent, meaning in the future, you start seeing that the Jews, you know, some Jews went on this way, some Jews went on that way. But during this time, it wasn't yet apparent, leaving the fold, leaving, it wasn't yet apparent when he was alive, but the roots, the roots were being placed. The roots were being placed. And this is so important because there's so many things. Our world moves so fast. And so many things, the roots are being placed today that the, the, what's going to come to fruition for but what's happening now, you're only going to see it in generations to come or in 10 generations to come. The woke culture now, we don't even begin to see the damage that it does until the next few generations where we're going to start seeing, it'll be like, oh my gosh, like they destroyed the world. They destroyed the world with this, with this thought process. So there's so many things that were just being placed into it, like being planted. And when it bears fruit, it's going to be so destructive. Vice versa. Also, you have so much amazing things that are happening that will bear a tremendous amount of fruits. You have things like Torah Anytime. You have the you have organizations that are able to like put something out there that will be for generations to come. Though there's so much in both areas, in good and bad, of what will actually happen. But during the time of Antigonus, he foresaw this this going in a certain direction, and that's why he came out with uh, you know with this uh, with this Mishnah. That's one of the reasons, let's say, that he came out with this Mishnah. So. The, the Jews that decided that they wanted to start going towards this Greek culture, they really only adopted this thought process externally, meaning that they would, let's say, speak in the Greek language, they would go in the... In, you know the pl the public you know amusement whenever they travel but like in home they acted a little bit differently and you know but as you know as time goes on you know one thing leads to another and it becomes a little bit of uh you know a little bit more relaxed so these people are known as uh you know the hellenization the people that that became more more hellenized what ended up happening is these people that were more Hellenized, they were more prone, they wanted to go into Greek cultures, they ended up becoming students of Tzaddik and Baisos. So these two students, Tzaddik and Baisos, they, they ended up creating some, you know, a following. And they were known as Tzedukim, after Tzaddik. Tzedukim was the Sadducees, which is the more popular one. And by Susan was also, you know, not as popular now. Now we know more in historical, when we look back and we look more at the Tzedukim. But again, this was the two students that they created a thought process. The people that were prone to this Greek mythology, the Greek ideology, they wanted to go this. They sort of became, you know, they studied under these... Uh, under these two students of Antigonus, Tzaddik, and, and Baithoth. But really, all this, all this like framework of like, okay, so now we're going to listen to the Torah only and not to the rabbis, this was just a front. The front was they wanted to deny the Torah, but they knew they couldn't deny the Torah, so they just, okay, we'll deny, we'll, we'll make it a little bit lax by denying what the sages were, were saying. And in fact, if you look at history, uh, Josephus, Josephus Flavius, he went and he described these people that Sadukim were basically not religious. They were not religious people, but they used this sort of cover like, no, we listen to the Torah, we don't listen to this. But they were for all practical purposes, they were not um, they were not religious. So that brings us to the to, to the, the, the the meat and potatoes of this actual of the the share of the class. You look at these people, you have they had a following, meaning they had a belief, they had a desire. And they needed to make this legitimate. Their desire was they wanted to be more Greek-like. 
but they knew that it, it's against the Torah. It's against the Torah. You know, it's, it's a, many of the things are sins. Many, like, it's completely against the Torah. So they had to make it legitimate. So they had to do what is called rationalizing. They had to rationalize their thought process. And that's why they have to come to the conclusion, oh, wait a minute. You know, we don't really need to listen to the rabbis. We don't need to really do this. You know how people come and they start rationalizing and they come to a conclusion where they exactly where they want to be. And that's what rationalization is the process of coming up with a rational explanation for a certain behavior. Meaning you you were you're making you're you're engaging in a certain behavior and you want that behavior to seem optimal. You want that behavior to seem good. You want that behavior to seem correct. So you make up some sort of rationalization, which in, in other words, it's an excuse, to make it seem okay. And this is something that everybody does. We all do it all the time. You see it very, very like broadly seen, like very clearly seen. You see it in the dating world. You see when people are dating, you have like, like sometimes there's a massive problem and the, the, you know, one side like doesn't see the problem. Uh, whatever it is, it could be anger issues, it could be a drug problem, doesn't matter, whatever, it could be a massive problem. But let, let's, let's be a little bit more specific. Let's say a girl is getting a, 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 get, dating a guy and this guy that she finds out that has somewhat of a drug problem. Again, when you say s drug problem, the somewhat doesn't make that much of a difference. But let's say he has some sort, sort of, of a drug problem. But then she starts thinking, okay, wait, comes from a lot of money and he's very good looking and he's gonna provide me a good life. And you start like, okay, so you start rationalizing the drug isn't really so bad. It's really not that often. He doesn't really get that much into it. You start rationalizing because you want to go to a certain conclusion. You want to continue dating this guy so you say, okay, fine, it's not that bad because of X, Y, and Z. And it goes, again, it goes vice versa for, for men to women as well. Uh, and it goes, by the way, the other way around, where let's say somebody is dating, uh, you know, a girl or whatever, a girl's dating a guy, and they start finding problems. But these are not real problems. These are just, a, the, the person has cold feet. So they start making up problems. Oh, well, you know, her last name is so far away from the alphabet that mine is it really going to make that much of a difference. You know, like, I don't know. She's in a completely different zip code. How are we going to be able to figure it out? I, oh, my gosh. I, you know, like, her shoe size is not what I thought it was. You know, like, people come to, like, some sort of, like, weird conclusions. And they're like, oh, you know, like, there's got to be a red flag. I mean, he's financing his car. He's not leasing it. Like, come on, Rabbi. Like, are you kidding me? Like, the if that's not a red flag, I don't know what is. You know, like they come to like some sort of retarded, you know, conclusions and they're like, okay, I, you know, like I have to run away. Why? Because let's say it's getting too serious. Let's say everything is matching up. Let's say everything is working out and they get nervous. They get cold feet. They're like, oh, wait a minute. We can't, uh, you know, we can't do that. So it goes in, 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 in both ways. Like I tell you, I think I've shared this story before. And I, when I was in high school, I decided I wanted to buy a digital camera. Um, this this was quite some time ago. You're talking about 20 something years ago, 20 some maybe 25 years ago. I don't know, a long time ago. I decided, and this is like kind of right when digital ca cameras started coming out and becoming popular. So you have a digital camera, which was like probably like back then the way that you decide how good a digital camera was was like how many megapixels it was. Like now there's a lot of different you know factors that come to play with that. Back then it was like oh it has two megapixels. Oh my gosh, you know like now they have like 500 megapixels, like whatever. Like and you know the uh, people that are into photography know all the details, the the FSO, whatever, you know the contrast. Right? There's so many things in it. Back then it was like kind of like for the layman it was like oh how many pixels, how many megapixels it was. It was like. By today's standard, it would be the worst of the worst of the worst, you know, camera to get the best back then. I think maybe it was like a two megapixel camera or something like that. And I was searching, you know, online, uh, you know, this is right also when the internet came out. Um, I was searching online to buy something and I ended up coming across a camera that I decided I liked, I wanted. It was a Canon. I don't remember the model number, but it was about... $500. It was a lot of money. $500 for a camera back then was a tremendous amount of money. So um, I'm thinking about... You know, I should probably, you know, this is the one I, you know, like I really like it. I, you know, I start looking online. Maybe I can find it somewhere cheaper. Me, you know, like back then eBay was very popular. And um, I started bidding like in a, in a very, you know, like a cheap, whatever. I started searching for it and, and trying to do some, getting something for it for a little bit of a better deal. And then I get an email. I got an email from a guy from Shenzhen, China. And he's like, I see that you're looking for this and this camera. 
And me, a naive, you know, high schooler, and I'm like, yes, indeed, I am looking for this, uh, you know, for this camera. So uh, he responds, I, I say he, it could be, you know, it could have been a 65-year-old grandma or a six-year-old Chinese girl. I don't know what it was. But it was, I'm going back and forth, and they're like, you know, I work in China, I work in, you know, in the area, and I could get you this camera. And he listed me so many extras for this camera for $415. Now, I just thought I won the jackpot. This was before the Nigerian prince emailed me and told me that he has $15 million for me. And, you know, like in his bank account, this is before that whole spiel came out. And I'm like, are you kidding me? For $415 with all these extras? Like, I am so in. Like, yes, you know, sign me up. So he, he sends me back an email. And by the way, there were red flags that this was a scam from the beginning, right? From the very beginning. But he emails me back. And he's like, if you, um, you know, send me the money, you have to send me a check. Red flag number one. I had to overnight a check to China. Red flag number one. And I'm like, sure, no problem. So he's like, if you do a regular mail, I'll give you the price of 450 which again, this the value was like six, $700. If you overnight for me, I'll give it to you for $415. So I said, okay. I ran to the post office. I made out a check and I put it inside over there and uh, I was about to seal it and overnight it for it was like another 30 bucks to just what it wasn't overnight whatever it was like next day year uh to overnight to, to send it fast and then i remembered i'm like wait a minute he never asked me for my address so instead of being red flag number 7055 i was like well let me just take another piece of paper write my address so he could know where to ship it to me and that's what i did i send it and i send him this i send him this check he cashes the check i start emailing it you know when is it coming no answer a week, two weeks, three weeks go by. And then only later I realized that this guy completely scammed me. And for years, it was my family, the family joke that I was supporting some guy in, you know, Shenzhen, China with, oh, you know, sending him money so fast so I could get a little bit of a, of a better deal. Now, there were many, 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 many red flags that I should have been like, hmm, maybe I shouldn't message this guy. Maybe I shouldn't go and, you know, you know, deal with this, with this person. And it's, it's all a fraud. It's all fake. But in my mind, I rationalize it. It was such a good deal that I wanted to get it. I wanted to be, I, I wanted to connect it. And by the way, this happened to me almost again. And so really it's Minna Shemayim that this worked out the way that it worked out, that I didn't get this, uh, this camera, you know, that I, I fell into this trap because years later when I was, uh, you know, ready out of high school and I wanted to buy my first car, I was researching. I'm very big into research. I guess you guys know that. Very, and then I came across some person who was able to get me a car. I'm not going to go through the whole spiel. It was like an interesting, it was a Nissan Maxima orange color. Like I didn't even need it or wanted that. But it was a joke of a price from England. They were going to ship it. The whole, it was like a whole back and forth spiel. And I almost fell for it because again, it was like a great deal. And then I was like, okay, wait a minute. Like something doesn't seem right over here. And it ended up being a scam, but Baruch Hashem, that was thousands of dollars that would have been, uh, you know, as opposed to the few hundred that I that I lost. So of course, like the Baruch Hu works in, in mysterious ways that we could see only later on how it works for our benefit. But what when this scam artist came and, and I took my money, took in my mind, all the red flags didn't matter because I rationalized everything. Oh, he didn't ask me for my address because, you know, like he probably didn't even realize it. So let me just send it to him. Oh, he wants it to overnight it so he could send it to me quicker. Like everything that was would have been a red flag, I didn't see it because in my mind I wanted it. I wanted the outcome. So anything that blocked my outcome, I'll be like, no, okay, fine, wait a minute. That, that you know, like let me, I made an answer for it. And that's what rationalization comes to, 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 to a person. That's how it destroys a person. It can destroy, it, 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 you could do it a positive spin for it as well, right? You can make a, you need to make a big purchase and you say, you know what, I'm going to use it for spiritual purposes. And now you, it becomes a mitzvah. So like you could rationalize a purchase even for the other way around. But again, rationalization has a tremendous effect on, on how we interact, how we think, and how our outcomes are going to be and what mistakes we will make. In 1997, there was a um, there was a cult by the, by the name of Heaven's Gate Cult, a very famous cult. And they believed that a spaceship is coming on the tail of the Haley Bob comet. There was a comet. On the tail of that, there was going to be a spaceship. And many of them believed that if they go through a mass suicide, they kill themselves, they will be sent up 
during the right time, they will be sent up to the spaceship and they will be taken to, you know, like, uh, you know, to the, to the heaven, to wherever they need to. So many of them went and they purchased a telescope to see, I look at this uh, to find the, to find the spaceship and to find this, this comet. So the ones that didn't kill themselves, the ones that didn't go through with it, they came back, they bought, they each bought a very expensive telescope and they went back to the store and be like, there's something wrong with your telescope. And the guy's like, what do you mean? What's wrong? So he's like, we looked through the telescope. We saw the comet, but we never saw the spaceship. So that means that something is wrong with your telescope. They didn't think that, no, maybe there was never a spaceship. Because if there would be never a spaceship, they would be wrong. And people don't like being wrong. So they said, you know what? Instead of me being wrong all this time, instead of me investing all this time and money into this cult, what really is the problem, it's the telescope that's the problem. And that's why we didn't see the spaceship, not because it didn't exist, because it was a faulty telescope. That's how far they went. That's how far rationalization can take you. You could be looking at something so straight on. You could be looking at something that's so like, obvious and you won't see it because you're rationalizing everything in your mind. And this is the Gemara in Ervin, page 19a tells us that even people in the gate of Gehenna, they're sitting at the gate of the Gehenna, they're not going to do tshuva. The question is, why? Are you kidding me? Why would they not do They're literally sitting over there. And the answer is because they never thought they did anything wrong. They rationalized everything. They rationalized everything. You have people, you know, like it's one that I wanted this to be a shorter class. It ends up being longer than I intended it to be. But, you know, like you have people, I've spoken to people where they scam, they, they steal. And like I've spoken to other business people and I was like, I don't get it. Like, how do these people sleep at night? How, how do they go through it? In their mind, they're not doing anything wrong. Uh, I mean, maybe some of them are, but it's like a little bit of a psychotic thought process. In their mind, they can't think of them uh, that they're doing something wrong because then they can't live with themselves. So they rationalize for whatever reason that it, really it's not a problem. And, and the Gemara in Erechen tells us, and page 15b tells us that, uh, you know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that if there's an arrogant person, me and him, we cannot live in the same world. The question you could ask, be like, God is infinite. He can't live with another, he can't be in the same world with another arrogant person. Of course he can. And the answer is, it's not God that's lacking over here. It's that person cannot live in the same world as God. Because a person that's so arrogant, a person that always thinks that they're right, a person that constantly rationalizes everything that they do because they can never be wrong, they cannot stand together with God. They cannot, that, that God would stand in their way. So every, and then this is something fascinating and, and hard to like comprehend, but like every arrogant person has some sort of fear inside of there. And this brings us to the point of how careful we have to be how we think. Do we ever think about how we think? You know, do you ever realize that when you make a decision, most of your decisions are based off your emotions, not of your intellect. That is rational. Rationalization stems from the, the, the emotional aspect of, your, of, of what's pushing your thought process. Usually it's guilt, but whatever it is, the, the idea is, is that you rationalize so many decisions in our life. And it's crazy when we stop for a second and we're about to make a big decision and we're like, are we rationalizing this? Are we coming to the right conclusion? The real answer is, is that if you're not sure, you speak to a rabbi. You speak to somebody. Of course, you know, the, the tzedukim and the baisusim, they were not able to do that because <laughs> you, can't, you can't speak to a rabbi because the rabbis are making it up, right? The rabbis, so they went completely against it and there was no way to correct it because they never even gave themselves a chance. And this is why the Rambam, the Rambam says you have to be careful, you have to be careful what you're, uh, let's see how much time we have left. You have to be, you have to be careful with what you are, um, with what you say. So it, so whatever comes out, the people should not be able to get confused or bend the truth, or like not sure what you meant. Meaning you have to be clear in what you say. And the Rambam says something very interesting. Mamani says that the, if there's a student that's already on the edge, meaning they're not sure about their beliefs, and then there is an option of getting it latching onto like false ideas, they'll latch onto these false ideas, these beliefs. And the, the Rambam, it seems to say the Rambam is saying that even before Antigonus mention all this about, you know, reward and, the, you know, like uh, you shouldn't more do it for reward. And then the Tzaddik and Baisas went and they switched the words and they're saying there's no reward, which again, this is not what he meant. They were, uh, these, these two students were already inclined 
to think negatively. They were already inclined to think, uh, you know, uh, the kfira. And when they heard, they heard it, they were waiting for an opportunity to find support for what they wanted to do. They wanted to, they wanted to out, right? They wanted out of enjoy, out, out of, of, of uh, Torah. They wanted to just do, live life full of pleasure. So when they found an opportunity, but like, wait a minute, we can interpret this this way. Like that, so they rationalized in mind, this is what, this is what he meant. Again, they could have asked. They didn't ask. Why? Because they wanted specifically, this is how they, this is, this is how they wanted to interpret it. However, the Rambam says, it, you know, in a different place, he says, no, that Sadiq and, ba- and, and Baisus, they failed to understand the real message. So, in one instance, it, seems, it almost seems like it's a, it's a contradiction. In one instance, the Rambam says, oh, they, you know, like, they were already on edge, they were already inclined to go to one direction. In another instance, the Rambam says, no, they failed to understand it. So it seems like they were almost like a good person and they just made a mistake. And, it, and the officer of Nassim does make it sound like way. They were good people at first and then they made a mistake. So which one was it? Were they good people and made a mistake? Or were they bad people from the beginning and they just look, look for an excuse? So let's get this idea and then we'll end off with uh, whatever. We'll see how we'll, we'll, maybe we'll end off this. Maybe we'll push it a little bit more. So listen to this fascinating Rashi. Later in Avis, in the sixth pa- uh, parak in Avis, sixth chapter in Avis, David Melech learns two things from Achitaifel. David still refers to him, to Achitaifel, as his teacher, as his guide. And Rashi explains as follows, that if David Melech, King David, who was the king of all of Israel, he praised Achitaifel, which Rashi then goes and says, who was a wicked person, he was a Rasha, he was a wicked person, and he was completely undeserving of covet. But he taught him two things. So he gave him a title of rabbi and my guide, my mentor. So therefore, says Rashi, a common person who learns, if let's say you're a regular person and you learn something from your friend who is not wicked, certainly you should respect this person because they go went and they, and they, and they taught you uh, what, whatever it is that they, what they taught you. So now asks Rabbi Ruben Feinstein, why does Rashi give Achitofel the title of wicked person? At this point in his life, he was not a wicked person. There's no mention of him being a wicked person. It happens to be the truth of the matter is, later on in the life of Achitofel, he sided with Avshalom and there was a rebellion and he was a, you know, a wicked person. But again, you could also excuse that the main reason that he did it was because of Bathsheba, his granddaughter. Again, we're not going to get into that whole detail. But during this time, this person who was later characterized as wicked was not wicked back then. Like, so why? Why did Rashi go and classify him as a, as a wicked person? So we learned this from Rashi. It says what Ruben Feinstein. We, uh, we learned from this that if a person has one incident, one issue, and he completely turns around or she completely turns around and becomes a wicked person, meaning they were a regular person, and then one thing happens, and they completely turn on 180 degrees, and they become a wicked person, that means that deep in their heart, they were, that evil always existed. And this was just the opportunity for it to come out. Because if a person was strong, if a person had that, that you know, was, was a righteous person, that even if they had one ability, one opportunity, one occurrence, that could not possibly change a person completely. It just if it's the evil already lurked inside of that person, then it comes out. And we see this, explains the Rebbe Fights. So we see this in Elisha ben Avua. Elisha ben Avua was known as Acher. So Acher, what was the Acher story? We spoke about this, you know, uh, Yom Kippur class a few years ago, I believe it was. So we, saw, we know Acher was a Tana. And he went off. He became uh, secular. What happens? He saw a person, uh, there's a few opinions. One of them is that he saw a person performing a mitzvah of Kibbut Aim and Shiloh HaKan. Meaning that he was performing, he was honoring his parents and he was sending the, the mother bird away from its, from its eggs. Both of these mitzvahs, the Torah says you're going to live a long life. While he was doing this mitzvah, this person fell off the ladder and died. So Acher says, he sees this, he says, wait a minute. The Torah says that you're supposed to live a long life. How is this person doing it and he's not going to live a long life? The simple and obvious answer is that it's not referring to the long life in this world. It's referring to the, into, into the world to come. But he utilized this thing and be like, checked off, okay, let me leave. Others say, what was his reason that Acher left the fold? It was because he saw the, the tongue of Rabbi Chutzvah Ahmed Turgman. He saw the, uh, a huge rabbi and the tongue was on the floor. Was, and, and he said, oh, this is the mouth that expressed so many Torah pearls of wisdoms of Torah. It's going to be on the floor? No, must be that Torah is not true. And, and, and he left. And the question you can ask would be like, wait a minute. You have here a tongue 
Elisha ben Avua. It's a huge rabbi. You know, like he became a cover because he saw one thing or he saw two things. Like that's what like, okay, you know, like it must be, it must be, you know, like out. Yeah, there's another reason we're going to the part this, but I can get into all the reasons. But like he saw one, two, three things and then they like checked him out. And the answer is, explains Rabu and Feinstein, that if he would have believed in God, real true belief in Hashem, he would have worked to find any contradictions that he might have thought he had. He would have went to try to find the, the, the answer to that. And even if he couldn't find the answer to that, he'd be like, if he's a real, you know, strong to God, he'd be like, even if he doesn't understand, he'd be like, okay, my mind is limited. I'm not going to leave God. I'm not going to leave the Torah because, oh, I don't understand what, the, what, you know, what happened over here. We know that our minds are limited. We know our understanding is limited. So if we don't understand something, if we can't give a reasoning for something, if we can't comprehend something, it doesn't mean we just check out because we know we don't understand everything. So if he would be on that caliber, that, that's what he should have done. But because Achar was already weak from the beginning, one or two things, just like the evil inside just rose up and he was and he, and he checked out. And in fact, it's very interesting. He mentions, you know, that already when he was younger, he was inclined towards evil. Acher says this about himself in Yerushalmi, in Mesech this Chagiga. It says that Elisha ben Avua would expound on a Pasuk that says that the end is better than its beginning. And he was referring to his own life. Meaning the end of the matter is defined by, his, by its beginning. And what happened was in, in uh, Elisha ben Avua's beginning, is that his father Avua was a great person in, in Yerushalayim, and when it came to Elisha's uh, um, his bris, he went and he invited all the righteous people, all the tzaddikim, and Rabbi Elazar there, Rabbi Yeshua was there, and when everybody was eating, when everyone was dancing, when everyone was in, in you know, the, the two big rabbis said to each other, well, "What are we sitting over here, just wasting time? Let's go on the side and let's learn." So they went on the side, they started learning, and a heavenly fire came around and encircled them. Now, Avua, Alicia's father, saw it. He ran over to them. He says, what are you doing? He says, you're going to burn down my house. And they, you know, like, you know, they said, no, 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 don't worry about it. It's not going to burn down your house. This is the fire of Torah. Just like the fire goes down, came down by Harsinai, the fire attaches itself to it because of the Torah that they're learning. So Avua, the Elisha's father, said, if Torah is so great that you're able to bring down fire from heaven, because this son that I just had, I'm going to devote him to Torah. So at Elisha's beginning, his father did not have pure intentions. He wanted it for the covet. He wanted it for what you know, the fire, whatever, whatever you want to uh, explain that to mean. But he didn't have he didn't have pure intentions. And as he grew older, these seeds began to sprout. And we, we know the Gemara says that he was always singing Greek songs, like non-Jewish songs. He would always, if, if when he got out from the base medrash, he had like Greek books that would fall from his you know desk that he had that he was that he was reading, meaning that. It was already brewing inside of him for a long time. And then when he saw a person get, you know, die after, while doing a mitzvah that should give him a long life, or he saw that, that was just the finishing touches of a person. And this explains what we fancy is the same thing that happened with Sadak and Baisus. They were, you know, if, if it, it doesn't make any sense. If they were two upstanding Torah scholars and they heard this, they could have ser- simply just asked a rabbi, like, what, you know, just a question, you know, rabbi. Does that mean no reward? Like, why didn't they even begin to ask it? And the answer is because they were, they had this desire the whole time. They had this thought process the whole time. And they just needed some sort of excuse to tap into it and then just go their path that they wanted to. So now with this understanding, we can begin to understand the Rambam. The Rambam made a statement that seems to contradict each other. He said, one, that they were good and they made a mistake. They didn't, they didn't understand it. And number two, is that um, is that they were you know evil already you know like they were inclined towards evil from the beginning, and the answer is that they're both correct. They used this tragic mistake. This caused them, this caused them to sin. This wouldn't have happened if they didn't have that direction beforehand. They could have, meaning that they wanted to go in this direction beforehand. Meaning that they could have asked if they wanted to, but they always harbored this feeling, this leaning towards heresy inside them. This leaning towards leaving the Torah. To, 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 the, this culture, this Greek culture was spreading so out and they were very enticed by it. And they wanted to go into that. And so they used a mistake that they ended up you know, bringing upon themselves to bring about the conclusion that they wanted to. And this is why they needed to rationalize what they wanted. They couldn't just leave because they know that's wrong. But they found something and be like, oh, 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 you see? No reward. So why are we even doing this? Yeah, why not? Let's have fun. You know, have a good time. So they left everything because they, had, uh, they, had, they needed an ability to rationalize it. 
one who is devoted to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, one who is devoted to Hashem, does whatever God wants them to do. And if we don't know, we ask a rabbi. And they, the reason they didn't want to clarify is because they knew that there was some sort of answer. They didn't want it. They wanted the question. There's so many times that people come to rabbis, people come to ask, they just want the question. They don't want the answer. I can't tell you, it's, sometimes it's so tiring, but you have to do it, but like, it's so, you, like the person that's asking you the question, they have no interest in your answer. They just want to ask a question, meaning that they want to leave. They want to justify, they want to rationalize whatever they want. Like I had a guy that came to me once, and he's like, you know what, I'm not religious because of the Holocaust. I'm like, the, what, how, what does that have to do with you? Like, like what you're going in history and be like, oh, let me find something. Oh, yeah, okay, fine, now, now I'm not going to be religious. How could God do such a thing? I, you know, like... God didn't do it. Like it's like, like, and I even backed up. Like what, any of your parents or aunts, it wasn't. They weren't even involved in the Holocaust of themselves. Like I myself, I have I lost you know ancestors you know in the Holocaust. I'm like you know if anything somebody else would happen because but at the end of the day that's what it was. It was an excuse. It wasn't that they looked through history and they were like hmm to be religious or not to be religious and they were like no Holocaust no must be not. The answer is it has nothing to do with the Holocaust. You don't need to answer the Holocaust. You need to, all these people that they have questions on the Torah. Majority of them. Majority, not all of them. Some of them are real, and you have to. That's why you don't know. You have to really answer everybody. But like majority of them, they just want a way out. They just want a way that say like, okay, I want to live my life freely in a way that I can do whatever I want and not feel bad about it. So they come up with questions, and then they say, oh, okay, this is why I'm not religious anymore. And in their mind, they rationalize it to think that they're okay. Like, and most of them, they get the questions from websites that there's somebody that went off and then brought up all the, the all the information to give to the you know to you know when you ask your rabbi tell, ask him these questions these are difficult questions and when i present i'm like oh wait you found this on this on this website i happened to cut yeah maybe i came across a website i'm like you're asking the question word for word from this website like i'm familiar with the website you're like you're you're asking all the yeah well you know like i had other questions on this you know like so at the end of the day they wanted questions so they search for questions and they come to you to make the feel bad oh you see i went to ask and i never got an answer I'm like no you got an answer you just didn't like it or whatever it was and you came to the conclusion, and this wasn't even your question to begin with. You just went and you found the question, you brought it and be like, aha, you see, now I can do whatever I want. Now I can do it when there's no problem whatsoever. Then, because they rationalize. We rationalize it. And this is how careful we have to be. Now, this is some, you know, it's very obvious when I state it like that, but we make these decisions in our own in our own life. We make this decision in our own life. We pull ourselves, if we were to go and pull ourselves out of our equation, so many things will be answered. And that is why, like so many times, when people come and they ask me a question, a lot of times the answers are right there. The answers are right there, but they're too much invested in the equation, so it's hard to be able to comprehend. It's hard to be able to answer, so that's why it throws them off. But really, so many things are so clear for us, but sometimes we have to pull ourselves out because we rationalize to a certain direction. There. Give me a few more minutes. I ended up, I really wanted to make this... Um, I really wanted to make this a little bit of a shorter class, but it is what it is. Um, the, you know, after October 7th, the, the collapse in the Israeli left, um, you know, the, the liberal Israeli parties, the liberal thought process was completely changed. Up to October 7th, the way that you'll be able to identify who was left and who was right, to a certain extent, not all, to a certain extent, you could ask them, do you support a Palestinian state or not? Like, this is the way that you could go and present the information, and they, you know, based on the answer, you could kind of, like, you know, you see where, where they're holding. So there was a psychologist by the name of Nimrod Nir. I got that name. Nimrod Nir. He said, he found that, like, now, he did a, he did a study, he did a, you know, he, he, he did a poll, he did polls and studies, and he found that now, even the left, nobody wants a Palestinian state. Like, nobody wants, like, they saw what happened after October 7th. Like, everybody came to the conclusion, like, nobody wants a Palestinian state. Two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, you have all these left liberal minds of, of course, Palestinians, equal rights, we should give them, we're the oppressions, we're the more successful, we should give them, blah, 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 all that information. After October 7th, there was no pity for the Palestinians. They were like, no, there is our terrorists and we, they should be destroyed. Like, that's their mindset. It completely, a completely switch, completely turned around. 
Now, why did it turn around? That the mindset of the, the Palestinians always thought the same way. They support Hamas. They support what they did in the West Bank. Everybody support, like the majority still support of what they did. Not everybody, but a majority do, do support them. So what happened that the Israelis now all of a sudden switched their mindset? Like, what, before October 7th, you didn't think the Palestinians wanted to kill you? You didn't think that they hated you? You didn't think that, you know, the answer is no, because they felt that in the liberal mindset, in the woke mindset, no. We have to do equal rights, even if people hate us, even if people don't like us, we still have to give them equal rights. Oh, but then when you see when they murder and when they do despicable things, oh, then now, okay, now we understand why we have a wall. Now we understand why we have to have an army. Now we have to understand why we have to defend ourselves. So what happened is, what and, and was, is that you have a mindset, you have a thought process, and now all of a sudden you hear what happens on October 7th, so you get angry. So your emotions take charge and be like, nope, now there's no Palestinian state. I'm gonna stand. I don't. We don't support it. What's gonna happen in a few years? What's gonna happen? Like, what do you think happened after the the War of Independence? What, what in 1967, the Yom Kippur War, like what, the Six Day War, like all these wars that Israel had? Like initially, they were very against them. But eventually, people forget, people rationalize, people come to some sort of weird conclusion that they come to the woke liberal mindset that they decide whatever they think is that is right based off their current our current mindset. That's the problem when you have somebody that bases off their current mindset they don't go to rabbis they don't ask you know das taira if you go and if you ask the you know what should be done like in this since the beginning you know like you wanted a palestinian you whatever decision that you need to make if you're not sure about something you ask a rav you ask a rabbi you ask your mentor you ask you 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 know you you ask it what happened was over here by Tzaddik and Baisas, they didn't ask to clarify. They had something and they wanted that conclusion. So they didn't want any clarification. That's what they wanted. And it's very interesting because we spoke, you know, now there's a, a, a psychologist by the name of Nimrod. I don't know why, why Israeli people, Nimrod was a very bad person, right? Why would anybody, you know, in, the, in, in Tanakh, why would anybody uh, name their kid Nimrod? So it's very interesting, Rabbi Yaakov Hillel, on the names, because this this story, this uh, Mishnah, Antigonus, Antigonus is not a Jewish name. Antigonus is not, uh, you know, like, if, you know, the, 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 the biggest rabbi in the world at that time did not have a Jewish name. Now, if Antigonus would be alive today, many people would be like, you know, rabbi, you got to change your name. You can't have a name like that. You got to have, a, you know, you got to have a, a, a Jewish name. You have to have a Hebrew name. Now, the truth is that a Jewish name is infinitely better than a non-Jewish name. The, the, it, it infects the, the, the child. And this is, by the way, from Yerab Yaakov Hillel and Mekubal. So he's saying, there's no doubt that a Jewish name is infinite. Infinite, like, not like a thousand times better. Like, a tremendous amount, the amount of, of positive influence that it has in a child, a Jewish name is sur far surpasses anything else. So, and, and to the point also is that you know, like even the way the name was spelled, even the name, the name, like when a parent gives a name to a child, that has a correct, direct influence on how that child is going to be, to the finest spelling, the finest detail of it. And in fact, there is a, a there's a safer, there's a book called um, there's a book called Shamus Gitten. Uh, the the names forget, meaning that if a woman and a man are married and they want to get divorced, so on the the bill of divorce, which is called a get, you have to write the correct spelling of the woman's name. If you misspell the woman's name, this woman, she had the divorce paper, but this woman, halakhically, she's still considered married. It's, it's a huge problem. So they, had, they made a book of all the names, of all the names, so you know exactly the correct spelling of it. Many of these names, not many, they're, 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 there's a lot of these names that are not Jewish in there. And people think, okay, wait a minute, you have to have a Jewish name. And again, you should have a Jewish name. Jewish name is infinitely better than a non-Jewish name. But what we have to realize is also that people jump on changing names is a huge, huge endeavor. So if you're Megayer, you have to change your name. Like, there are certain things that you have to, but majority of the time you should not be changing your name. And if you do need for whatever change your name, you really have to go to a big couple to be able to say, okay, this is the reasons why why I want to, uh, you know, why I want to uh, change your name. And the proof of the matter is, you see, Antigonus. Antigonus had a non-Jewish name, whatever whatever that reason it was, but he didn't change it. He didn't become Melchanan. He didn't become like, they didn't switch his name to that. Antigonus was, was his name. I don't know any other, other Antigonus besides Antigonus Ish Saichai. Never heard of another, another Antigonus. Maybe there was, maybe he had a grandchild that name, but 
It's very interesting. When you look at name, of course, there, it is so much, so, 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 so much better to have a Jewish name and it's, it's powerful for your child and it's going to help your child. But if somebody already named a non-Jewish name, it's very, you have to be very hesitant to go and start changing names. You do have to look into that, um, you know, and speak to Makobo, speak to a big rabbi before you do, uh, you do such a thing. But anyways, let's wrap it up and we'll open up to any questions. And uh, that is uh, the big lesson for tonight's class is how careful we have to be with rationalizations. We see over here, we have here two students of a huge, huge town of the big, greatest rabbi. Tzadik, uh, uh, the big, big greatest rabbi was, was Antigonus and he had two students, Tzadik and Baisus. And these two students, they were inclined towards going into uh, a secular lifestyle. So what happened? They went and they figured out a way to be able to go into the secular lifestyle. They figured out a way to excuse themselves to say, oh, you know what? I'm going to go into the, into this, into the secular, into the secular lifestyle. So, and they used whatever excuse that they could find because they rationalized it. They rationalized, they came to that conclusion and how careful we have to be with decisions that we make and how much we have to go and be careful not to rationalize our decisions. And if we're not sure, this is where we go and we ask our rabbis, we ask our mentors, we ask our teachers, help us, guide us to the right to the right path. If only, if only Tzaddik and Baisis would go and ask the rabbi to clarify all of the, the, the amount of effect that they, they did was a tremendous destruction to the Jewish, uh, to the Jewish nation. They were very, influential. The Tzedukim were very influential. They're very powerful. They had a lot of money. It caused a lot of problems, you know, throughout history in uh, uh, for the Jewish people. And so all that could have been avoided if only, if only they would have asked. But the truth of the matter is the reason why they didn't ask because they were already inclined to a more uh, uh, secular lifestyle and that's what they wanted. Okay, so before we open up to any questions, we'll do as usual. We'll say a capital to Helen for the soldiers, for our brothers and sisters in Eretz Yisrael, and then we will open up to uh, to any questions. So as usual, we say Kapitel Kuf Lamed, chapter 130. You could say it long, you should say it long. all right let's open up to questions okay not that many questions first one Oh, it's not a question, it's more of a comment. Rabbis are such a big part of Judaism. How else will we listen to Shirim and gain Torah knowledge for our souls? 100,000, uh, you know, percent. <laughs> Next thing was also a comment. I want to put the scammers in jail. They deserve to go in a very, very deep part in jail. Um, okay. Uh, next thing, environments can also have an impact on how someone thinks. So if you surround yourself with honest people, you will have honest thoughts. 100%. That's a great point. A great, great point. That if you have dishonest friends or, you know, like you put yourself in situations, uh, you, you work in an environment that it's dishonest, it is very, very detrimental. I completely agree. Next question is, I also want to know why I should made the Holocaust happen, but at the same time, I'm too afraid to find out why we deserve it. I think you, you answered it in a certain way. Now, again, nobody knows why why it ha had to happen but we know that every person that passed away in the holocaust they were supposed that this was what their destiny was whatever that means and however we understand it like you know again i could give you like one simple you know example and and again it's, it's a long story i'm gonna say it like in a half a minute but like the the, the gist was it was once a little boy that it was uh, that drowned in a mikvah that his parents built, and a lot of the you know people were asking questions like I don't understand like three you know not even th just turned three years old and he drowned in a mikvah that his own parents built. Later, it turned out that this boy came to a dream to his I don't recall if it was a mother or father I believe it was with the father, and uh, he said you know I was a big rabbi and you know in the previous life and I didn't the only thing I didn't do you know whatever he, he was lacking something and he needed to he needed to go to a mikvah and he had to wait till he was three years old and that's why he came to this amazing family who had the highest level of the mitzvah of mikvah long story short the only way that this soul would have been able to rectify what they needed is to go to be born in this family who did so much with the mikvah and pass away in the mikvah that they uh, that they built and that gives this person at the highest level possible and he showed them and he said your reward is immense because of what you went through so on and so forth but in any case 
this is just a fraction of a glimpse of what we begin to understand. Like, we don't know why Kaddish Baruch Hu did the Holocaust, but we know that every soul had a ticket, everything had to have a, to happen a certain a certain way. Okay. All right, looks like that was all for the questions. I thank you all for joining. Until next time, may you have an amazing, amazing, amazing everything.